everyone, I'm Tantacles, and this is the story of my attempt to make the hot girls of Final Fantasy VIII go fast. There can never be more than two girls in the party at once, as excessive womanhood could cause early time compression, and GFs will be limited, of course, to hot girls, Shiva, Siren, and Cactuar. And you may be wondering, why Cactuar? And we'll discuss that later in the video. Check out the Discordly Do if you want to see the full set of rules. At the beginning of our journey, there is plenty of hot, but no girl. We name Squall Claude, and then we get a glimpse of our game first hot girl, Quistis. She pretends that she's going to teach him to summon hot girls, but actually just takes our first hot girl, whom we name Iftits, for herself. And Iftits, despite being ice elemental, is so cool that she's hot, like Pop-Tarts. We also name Quetzalcoatl Burb. And then we head to the fire cavern. Before we get there, though, Claude chokes and dies, which is expected, because boys often choke on this test when Quistis comes with them. And our first boss, Ifrit, is a bit surprised that we have Iftits. He responds by trying to punch her to death, but she's smarter, prettier, and stronger than him, and she survives his desperate attack with just 4 HP. Ifrit is weak against ice damage, and we finish this battle primarily by summoning. We name Ifrit Shiva Man and head back to the Balam Garden. And during this section, we have no hot girls available to us. Well, no hot girl party members anyway, but we still have access to Iftits, and summoning her will be the only form of damage we can do during this section. And while most of the enemies are no problem, we do have a brief run in with a big snake. But Iftits, of course, is quite accustomed to dispatching all kinds of snakes in the grass. And a few light diamond dustings is enough to descale this serpentine simp. And now we finally meet our hero in training, Selfie. She'll have a special role in this run that we'll talk about a little bit later. She uses the Nunchaku, has a mediocre stat spread that focuses mostly on her magic stat, and also has the slot limit break. This will allow her to cast various magic spells, including four unique ones. Full Cure fully restores the party's HP and removes all status ailments except Zombie. Wall casts Protect and Shell on the party, Rapture removes almost all non-boss enemies from the battlefield, and The End is literally the most powerful spell in the game. It immediately destroys all non-undead enemies, but it's an extremely rare spell to see. And because we finally have a hot girl, she's on her own, as Claude and Zell will be sleeping soundly through the rest of the game. I make sure to draw the maximum number of Fire, Thunder, and Cure spells spells from one of the Galbadian soldiers, and I junction the cure spells to Selfie Spirit stat, and that is a great boon for the next fight. And that fight starts with Biggs and Wedge, who are honestly just an appetizer for Selfie's voracious bloodlust, and Elnoil swoops in soon after. To start this battle, we make sure to draw Siren, whom we'll talk about in just a bit, and we also try to grab some doubles, which will let us cast spells twice. And honestly, drawing doubles in this battle was a terrible idea. When you draw magic, your success of drawing a spell, as well as how many copies you get depends on three factors. The spell's draw resist, the character and the enemy's levels, and the character's magic stat. Selfie is at her lowest possible level, and her magic stat is garbage, so it's very difficult to draw this spell. And you may be wondering, why the hell did you try to draw doubles anyway? Isn't that slower? And the answer is, I didn't know that. I go into these runs without doing a ton of research, because there's nothing interesting about a confident person who's doing well. And you're here to watch me suffer. And because I do these runs blind, at the end of this video, we'll be looking at final in-game time rather than real time as a measure of how I did. And speaking of suffering, Selfie's HP is extremely low, and so is Iftit's. While Selfie has a reasonable spirit stat because she's junctioned cure to it, Elnoil has a strong storm breath attack that takes away about 150 HP. And the easiest way to do damage is of course to summon Iftit's, but Iftit's dies pretty quickly. And my poor tactical acumen means that Selfie soon boards the Phantom Train as well, which is not the kind of train she was hoping for. On my second attempt at this battle, I changed my priorities a bit. Of course I draw Siren, since without her this run would be frankly ridiculous, and If Tits meets the same fate again. But after If Tits dies, I focus exclusively on doing damage and healing when my HP goes below around 200. And after a tedious fight with a ton of close calls, Elnoil becomes Selfie's first victim, and we name Siren Julia. Wedge and Biggs, who clearly hate women, summon a robot to kill us. But we now have more options. In the last battle, If Tits learned the strength junction ability, meaning Selfie can now do a ton more physical damage. And more importantly, Julia has the magic junction ability, meaning Selfie can also now do much more magic damage, and she can draw spells much more easily. And this is important because Rob64 can dish out some pretty robust physical damage, but also has the protect spell, which Selfie can now draw to prevent some of that damage. And since Selfie's limit break primarily activates when she's at low HP, it becomes a lot safer to use with protect available. And that means that Selfie 
Sophie is able to finish off Rob with a Slots Thundara, a spell she certainly does not have in her inventory. Unfortunately, though, I get caught by Rob as I flee, and I have to fight it again. This time, though, I'm not messing around, and I let If Tits take care of it. So now, I just have to run to the... Oh god, I got caught a third time. Come on! Now, we just have to run to the ship, let a hot girl take out the robot, and bippity boppity boat back to Balam. Plot has passed this exam with flying colors, which is kind of funny since he literally let Selfie do all the work while he just lied there. He's Final Fantasy VIII's ultimate starfish. So we do a little dance and meet hot girl number three, Renoa, who has terrible taste in men. We flirt with Claude a little, and then we punish him for his laziness by bringing him to the training center to get beaten down by some armadillos. For real though, this fight only involves Quistis, who now has both Iftits and Julia equipped, meaning that she can grab some rather useful protect and shell spells here. And once she's done, Iftits does some dusting and rather easily takes them out. Oh, and my cat wanted to be brushed, so we take care of that too. And because our leading ladies love wood, their first mission is in timber. So we ride a train there. And by the way, did you know that Selfie likes trains? On my way though, we have our first foray into the past with Laguna. And despite the insistence by my stream chat that Laguna is a hot girl, he is not. Not a girl, I mean, he's super hot. So for all battles in the past, Laguna and gang will only be able to summon hot girls. This particular section though has no notable battles, so there's not too much to say about it. Oh, but there is another hot girl here and uh, that's all. When we get to Timber, the women use their feminine wiles to abduct a train, because riding one is not good enough for Selfie. Selfie really likes trains. Are you aware of it? We name Renoa Roxanne, and we name her dog Bum. Mainly because that means her counterattack is now named Bum Rush. Roxanne will be very important for this run later, but for now, she's not allowed in the party. And the kidnapping mission is almost successful, but we are thwarted by fake President Delling. And when we do enough damage to him, we're reminded that men only want one thing, and they're absolutely disgusting. But fortunately, this particular man is the undead Jirajiro, and one phoenix down is enough to take him out. So we watch some true crime television, kidnap the president, and meet the fourth hot girl of the run, Adia. More on her later. And then we ride another train, this time to Calbadia Garden. But before we get there, we have another flashback. This time, though, Laguna and the gang explore the Estar landscape, and we let Kiros handle things. Technically, he's possessed by a hot girl, so technically he's allowed to use attacks, but for the final battle here against the Estar soldiers, he summons Iftits, which means we really didn't need him in the first place. But back in the present at Galbadia Garden, our next mission is revealed. We have to kill hot girl sorceress Super Bay Badia. So we head to Delling City, get some dead kids numbers, and go to a parade celebrating her. Roxanne tries to disable her with a way too tight necklace, but Adia is above it all and would never hate on another woman like that. Instead, she kills the president because she's a strong, independent woman and she don't need no man. Unfortunately, though, some lizards come to life to attack Roxanne, which means for the first time, Claude wakes the F up to rescue her. Or rather, he wakes up so that he can ask Iftits and Julia to do the work for him. Iftits comes close to perishing, but ultimately she and Julia are able to effortlessly ice over these hateful Gila monsters. Immediately after, Quistis, Selfie, and Zell wander the sewers for a while. And let me muse for a moment. Why did the devs put three characters in this party? Literally, their only job was to throw a switch. Does that take three people? Couldn't hot girl Quistis have handled this job alone? It would have been far more fun to get to choose the party for the fight with Adia. And anyway, in preparation for that fight, I move all of my GFs to Roxanne. And if you think about the rules for just a moment, you'll realize that this is a huge mistake. Because before the fight with Adia, Claude has to fight Cypher. And his only acceptable action is summoning hot girls. And he has no hot girls. So he automatically loses and he dies. Fortunately though, we saved, and believe me, I'm sure I saved every single time that I should have in this run. They're gonna have no problems with that, right? And we junction if tits to him along with the GF command, and she is able to sweep up the competition. But now it's time for Adia, and this battle is pretty tough. There are two ways to win this battle. If you look at the Final Fantasy fandom's wiki, it literally says that the player cannot get a game over, but defeating Adia will grant the party some AP. Unfortunately, the first time I fight 
despite her, though, RNG is not on my side, and she defeats Roxanne even before she can put the boys to sleep. And the fandom wiki says you literally can't get a game over, so we have busted a myth in this run. The truth is, you can either defeat Adia by depleting her HP, or you survive long enough that she ends the battle on her own, which means that I have to be a bit more thoughtful. The reason Roxanne died, of course, is that her spirit stat, along with her HP, which she can't yet junction to, is atrocious, because she has Julia junctioned and not Iftits. So for my next attempt, I give Iftits to Roxanne and Julia to Cloud. The problem, though, is that Julia is far weaker than Iftits in terms of summon strength, so can Julia do enough damage to kill Cypher before Cypher kills Claude? And the answer is yes, she does that very easily. And this time, when we fight Adia, she ends the battle after only two attacks. Apparently, if the party is close to losing, she just ends the battle of her own accord. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but if you have any theories, you let me know in the comments. But anyway, at this point, hot girl Adia throws very hot ice through the already cold and dead body of Claude, and we get another flashback. This time, we play as only Laguna and Kiros, and they are once again dragged around by Julia and Iftitz. The strongest character in this section is, of course, Rain, who cuts Laguna down to size before we go to prison. Unfortunately, though, Roxanne gets removed from the party when her dad springs her out, so it's up to Zell to recover the party's equipment, which he does not do. He lets Iftitz do it for him. But anyway, we finally have our lovely ladies back, and they junction Iftitz and Julia to themselves once again. And the next battle is with Biggs and Wedge. This battle is a meme battle. I don't have access to it anymore, but the strategy guide I used as a kid recommended casting Zombie and Regen on Biggs and Wedge rather than actually fighting them outright because they're not hard and it's fun. However, despite that, this is actually an important battle for the run. They have some key spells for my character's stats and progression in the game. And while there might be a quicker way to do this, let me know in the comments, I draw 100 reflects, hastes, and regens on selfie. Unfortunately, Quistis's magic stat and level are still too low for her to draw effectively, but she does what she can. By the way, I don't save here. And I have to take a very deep breath here because the memory of not saving is hurting me on a spiritual level, a visceral level, literally giving giving me chest pain and making me poop myself in anticipation of what's coming up next. And that is not hot girl behavior. Because once I get through with all of that, we meet up with Claude and some Moombas, find out the prison is underground, and then Zell gets assaulted by a bunch of soldiers. And I forgot that he doesn't have a single GF equipped, which of course means that he cannot take any actions in battle and he dies. And the last time I saved was at the beginning of the Laguna sequence. I'm dying. I'm dying that so much progress lost, so many hot girl hours wasted. So I fight some monsters, I draw a bunch of stuff from Biggs and Wedge, I meet the Moombas, I descend to the bottom of the jail, and finally I remember to junction if tits to Zell. He is now able to use Ice Girl magic to destroy some men. Zell makes me hot and just saying that sentence flooded my basement. But anyway, back to hot girls. The next boss, a couple of robots and a Galbadian soldier, is easily dispatched by if tits and Julia. Which leads us to the most fun section of the run. We have to split the party in two. One half of the party goes to the missile base and the other half goes back to the garden. Given that the missile base portion is the shorter of the two, I send Selfie to the missile base alone and Roxanne and Quistis accompany Squall back to Balam Garden. So we head to the missile base. There are two ways to go through the base. You can cooperate and subtly sabotage the base or you can get caught and fight. I choose the former, adjust the missile's error ratio so it doesn't hit Balam Garden and I fight some guards. And honestly, these guys are pretty annoying. They can cast some moderately powerful magic and cure each other, making life a lot more difficult for Selfie. However, they do have a weakness, and that weakness is silence. If you silence them, they stop casting spells, and they focus most of their energy on healing each other. And conveniently, Julia pretty consistently causes the silence status to all enemies, which makes this battle a piece of cake. Hot girl cake, if you will. Unfortunately, though, we now have to fight another robot. And this is the battle that almost broke me. BGH251F2 is bulky and has a name that's hard to say, so we'll just call it La Tank Royale. La Tank has pretty strong physical attacks, but more importantly, has a powerful beam cannon attack. This attack does over 600 damage, and unfortunately, Selfie only has 597 HP. So I think you can guess how badly this went. I died. But this attack apparently can't have its damage reduced, so it's clear that I'm going to have to grind some more. Which means that this time, Selfie gets caught on purpose, and she goes full girl boss mode and fights everything she sees. The third time I fight Latank Royale, Selfie's HP is 711. Definitely enough both to get a big gulp and to avoid death from the beam cannon. But 
unfortunately not if Selfie has been hit by an attack before LaTank strikes her. So I die again. Literally wanted to give up here, but I soldier on for Selfie. Next time, she's at level 15 and HP 749, and it's looking a lot more promising this time. But it's difficult to get Selfie healed in time to survive, so she dies. But I think of a solution, and the solution is double. With double, Selfie can double cast Cure on herself, and since I was able to draw some Thundaga spells from a prior draw point, I double cast those on LaTank, and then I double cast my Thunder spells once they're depleted. And at long last, LaTank Royale is felled by a 17-year-old with excessively curled hair. Oh, and there are some men who come out of LaTank after it dies, and Selfie wrecks them too. And now I'm horny again. Unfortunately, the base blows up now, but if she can literally destroy a giant tank, I'm sure she'll be fine, and she can just store the boys inside her while she rolls away. And speaking of rolling, Balam Garden. I'm really sorry about that transition. But anyway, Balam Garden, let's go save it. So we head downstairs to save the place and fight the oil boils. And these guys cause some issues. We still have only one woman who can junction to defensive stats and their oil shot attack packs a wallop. So Quistus and Roxanne are defeated within seconds. And my second try doesn't go much better. But after doing some digging, and by that I mean my stream chat saved me here, I realized that they have a couple of weaknesses. They're vulnerable to the slow and sleep spells. I have a ton of sleep spells, so I junction those to Roxanne's status attack. I open the battle by slowing the oil boils and casting double on the two ladies, and then I put both oil boils to sleep. Subsequently, a smattering of doubled up spells takes out the first oil boil, and the second is quick to follow. Huge success. And now we're on to everyone's favorite bag of mucus pustules, Norg. The main struggle in the Norg battle is preventing his balls from casting spells on us, and I normally love balls, but not this time. So once we put Claude, who has been auto-revived into stasis, we let our strong lady GFs do the work for us. The first phase is primarily defensive, so we let if tits take care of it. In the second phase, though, Nork becomes more offensive-minded, casting strong water magic along with other offensive spells. He even manages to take out Roxanne and get Professor Dominatrix down to 23 HP. And I was pretty sure I was going to die here because I can't seem to get both of these ladies alive at the same time. But as it turns out, I had drawn some full life spells earlier, allowing me to get Quistus back to full health and continue on. And then she dies again. Help. But eventually, I'm able to batter him with enough damage that he goes down. And given the trauma of the last few battles and the fact that I desperately needed some testosterone in my life, I end the stream there for the day. Which seems like a good time to say that most people who watch my channel aren't actually subscribed. So if you're enjoying this video, give it a quick double check to make sure that that button is clicked. Because if you don't, I will never do a hot girl run ever again. Okay, I probably still will, but please hit the button. Anyway, we open up the second day of streaming by chatting with one one of my favorite characters, Dr. Katawaki. It's rare to see a physician in video games, let alone a female physician, so her presence always makes me smile. She's also an amazing card player, and while I won't spoil that part of the story for you, suffice it to say that she's an important part of one of my favorite side quests in this game. We next dock the garden boat in FH, or rather, we crash it into FH. And like, don't buy a boat, but if you're going to buy a boat, buy a giant houseboat that can fit an entire school of mercenaries inside it. That seems like a reasonable investment to me. Good luck finding that at a reasonable price though. We talked to the pacifist leader of FH and now it's time for the ladies to fight this stupid tank again. Not too much to say beyond, it's easier and we now have two characters to fight with. And Selfie is inside. See, I told you she'd survive. Now that the garden is fully operational, we head back to the town of Balam to fight Ragin. Unfortunately though, Quistus is the only character available to us because Selfie is a bit tired and Zell forces himself into the party. Now Ragin is a physical powerhouse, but once again, he has a very specific weakness, the sleep status. And once once Quistus puts him to sleep with her physical attacks, I draw some Thundaras from him as this is our first chance to get level 2 magic from any boss. I take him out with a combination of physical attacks and iptits and we head to our next real challenge, fighting Fujin and Ragin together. Ragin's stats are about the same, but he refuses to attack girls. I take him out first just in case he starts up with some shenanigans and then we get to work on Fujin. The first thing I do is draw Fujin's Pandemona GF. That stops her from casting strong wind magic, but Fujin has a another trick up her sleeve. She can speak in all caps like your mom on Facebook. 
Okay, okay, I'm kidding. What she can do is use her Psy attack to reduce HP to one, which in a one character battle is no bueno. But fortunately, I rally from this and I take her out with if tits as well. We name our new GF Pundemona, which I think describes my videos perfectly. We visit Trabia Garden, reminisce about being abandoned by our parents and visit our old orphanage, but not before we have a thrilling encounter with Calbadia Garden. They ram their ship into us and Roxanne, like the strong independent woman she is, dangles by a finger on the side of the garden for about an hour and a half while Claude figures out how to knock a Galbadian soldier off a rope. For the record, it's best to just cut off their fingers with your gunblade, but Claude's cognitive prowess has never been amazing. We name Griever Nala because that's a girl lion name, and we head into Galbadia Garden. There, I try to fight Cerberus, and I get completely wrecked because of its ability to triple cast spells. So instead of grinding over and over to take him out, I fight Cypher instead. This fight isn't hard in and of itself, but Cypher does have one important spell I need, Dispel. I draw those up to 100 before I do anything else. And while Cypher isn't a particularly easy foe, he mainly deals single target damage, meaning my characters are easily able to overcome him. And after we take him out, we head back to Cerberus. Cerberus is quite a hot dog. He has powerful magic, but more importantly, he can cast triple on himself, as I mentioned before, allowing him to cast his powerful magic three times in a row. But with our new Dispel magic, we're able to get rid of his triple whenever he applies it, making this battle much more reasonable. And while he's certainly not unthreatening, his main damaging spells, Tornado and Quake, are much less scary when they're only cast once at a time instead of thrice. So Quistus and Selfie take him down. That's bitch on bitch action right there. And we name Cerberus Zaldo because of his Triforce face. And now there's only one more obstacle before the end of Disc 2, Adia. This battle gave me a huge headache when I fought her with only Squall, but I think with two characters, I'll have a much easier time. The battle, of course, starts with another spar with Cypher, who's a bit of a pushover. But once he's done and Adia takes the reins, she gets spicy. Her Maelstrom attack removes three quarters of max HP from all characters and causes the curse status, which prevents all limit breaks. She also casts powerful elemental magic, and perhaps even more importantly, she can also cast the silence status. And she brings Quistus down and Selfie gets silenced. And while she does have the magic command along with life spells, what she doesn't have is the item command, which means she can't revive Quistus. And soon after, Adia does the worst thing she can possibly do, which is cast the death spell, which destroys my chances of winning this time. On my second try, though, I get double and haste cast on my characters relatively quickly. And while Adia does her best to both dispel these statuses and silence my characters, those actions end up being wasted turns. She does cast the death spell a couple of times, but even that is not enough to take out these two icons. So Adia eventually goes down and we name the GF we drew from her Lexi. And disc two is done. So we visit the girl who went unconscious, we visit the girl we just killed, and we visit a hot girl in the past. Okay, it's just Laguna. But in this one, we have to fight a ruby dragon with just a gun blade, which is no problem, really. You can retry this one as many times as you want. And then we have to actually fight a ruby dragon. And of course, I forget to equip the GF command, so these boys can't let the hot girls do the work. And everyone dies. But on my retry, I let the girl boss his boss, and after we seek out another magical girl, we head to Ethstar, and finally, 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 Claude wakes the f*** up and carries the girls for once. But after this, the ultimate hot girl joins our party. Yeah, the one we tried to kill. Twice. And if you think I'm not putting Adia in my party, you are f***ing insane. However, our next boss fight really could have been done by anyone. It's the Abaddon fight. We just take a phoenix plume off of Adia's feather boa, throw it at him, and he's down for the count. Which leads us to another Laguna section. And unfortunately, I forget to equip Laguna with a GF again, which means he goes down. And you're probably wondering, where did I last save? Well, I last saved during the last Laguna section. So once again, we fight the Ruby Dragon, cross the bridge with Roxanne, recruit Ultimate Hot Girl, and I save. That feels good. I should do that more often. Abaddon is once again a pushover, but now we're back to Laguna. And thank goodness if Tits takes out this S star soldier in one hit. But then there's another fight with a Gesper and two S star soldiers and because Laguna is possessed by a hot boy and not a hot girl, I removed his GF and put it on Kiros and Ward and I forgot to equip the GF command. Why? But this time, as you know, I saved right before Abaddon. And I got a little bored this time, so I used Kiragas and I used Adia's super hot limit break to take him out this time. I remember to equip the GF command and this battle, which is usually pitifully easy, goes just 
fine. And the rest of the Laguna section is much the same. And now we're in Esthar, and Esthar makes me very happy. Not only because it's a super cool, technologically advanced city, but also because it has a pet shop. And not only can I pet kitties here, I can also purchase scrolls that allow me to junction to all five main stats. And that means that most importantly, I can now junction magic to my HP stat. And if you haven't played this game, you might think this is only important because it makes my characters more bulky, but the real boon here is that the limit breaks in this game can be triggered infinitely as long as your character is at low percentage HP. At lower HP levels, I might have to bring my characters down to something like three to 400 HP to get a limit break proc, but now that threshold is more like a thousand and most attacks in this game do a lot less than a thousand HP of damage, especially now that I can junction magic to spirit and vitality with Julia. Anyway, after a bunch of plot stuff, we head into space, but not before we grab Solomon's ring from Tears Point, and you may be wondering why do you need that? And we'll talk about that in a bit. Choo choo! So we send Irvine into space and head back to Esthar with Quistus and Dedea. There, we attempt to apprehend the lunatic Pandora, and I make a bit of a mistake here that definitely cost me some time. There's a speed junction scroll here that definitely would have made the end game a lot easier, and I'm pretty sure this is the only time you can grab it, and I completely miss it. But I did remember to grab a Rosetta Stone as a random shop gift, which allows me to equip four secondary abilities to one of my GFs. I give that to Julia, and now I can massively boost magic, another trait that will come in very handy later. And after the lunatic Pandora boots us, we head to space, get tossed around by this hot girl, pop a giant space pimple, and save Roxanne for- God Damn it. Okay, let's try that again. Save a hot girl Roxanne from flying through space eternally. Yeah, first try, guys. First try. Which leads us to the Ragnarok. Now, if you've watched my Squall Only Challenge, which I will link in the discreetly diddly do, you will remember that the propagators on the Ragnarok gave me a lot of trouble. With Roxanne, there will be no trouble. Because Roxanne now has a new limit break that is criminally underrated, Angel Wing. This limit break randomly casts magic from Roxanne's inventory and gives it a quintuple damage multiplier. It also makes her immune to silence, berserk, and confuse. I can eventually manipulate her magic stock to make her do truly gargantuan amounts of damage, but we'll talk about that later. In any case, in terms of the propagators, the first purple one is a bit tough. It gets Roxanne down to around 40 HP before she's able to take it out with a bio. Purple 2 manages to hit her hard before she can cast Angel Wing, but a high potion is enough to recover her and get her into Angel Wing status, and she kills it with an Ultima. Starting with green one, I open every battle with protect, which gives Roxanne a lot more viability, and she takes that one out with two waters. Green two goes down to a bio, and there are four more to go. Red one and two go down to successive Ultima casts, and the yellows are the only ones left. Roxanne casts water on yellow one and gets a high damage roll, taking it out immediately. And my final obstacle is yellow two. I cast protect, and I get an angel wing off, but instead of casting offensive magic, Roxanne casts zombie. Ugh. And then she casts scan. Get that it out of here. I should have taken that out of her inventory, but with just 87 HP left, she casts Quake and it goes down in one hit, which means we now get an airship. But not before Roxanne gets accused of being a witch. Can no one in the Final Fantasy world handle a girl boss? What is wrong with these people? They capture her, we rescue her, and I grab Cactuar, our third and final usable GF from Cactuar Island. Why are we able to use Cactuar? Well, because plants are hermaphrodites. They have both male and female sexual organs, so they're kind kind of both sexes. Cactuar has the bonus abilities, which will give our strong women extra stats as they level up, and they also have the evade and luck junction ability. The speed junction would have been better had I gotten that goddamn scroll. But anyway, now we have the most painful part of the run. Remember how I got Solomon's ring earlier? Well, I got it for Selfie. You see, Selfie loves trains. And hot girls in my Final Fantasy world, they get what they want. And therefore, we have to use Solomon's ring to get a train for Selfie. In order to get Doom Train, you have to have six Remedy Pluses, six Malboro Tentacles, and six Steel Pipes in your inventory. And then you use Solomon's ring. Bada bing, bada bus. The Steel Pipes are no issue. You can grab those in the forest near Timber from Wendigos, which I I do. But in order to get those Remedy Pluses, you have to use Lexi's Med Level Up ability. So basically what that means is that if I want to respect the spirit of this challenge, I can get a train for Selfie, but I can't use it in battle. Furthermore, the six Malboro Tantacles are a pain. Malboros, which are the only enemy to drop Malboro Tantacles, almost always open with the Bad Breath ability, which casts a slurry of salacious status effects on my sexy sirens. That means that it's almost impossible to beat them without Quistus's Degenerator ability. 
that instantly kills almost all regular enemies, including Malboros. But the only way to get that item without using card mod is to kill a Gasper in the past with Laguna and friends. And I did do that, but it didn't drop the item. Editing Tentacles here to say that the item you need is the black hole item. Really missed an opportunity for a joke there. And since I don't want to use card mod to get anything that I would use in battle since it would completely break the game, I initially try to do things the hard way. I search for Malbros and Estar for about an hour, but none ever show up. I also head to the island closest to heaven on which there are some Malbros, but every enemy there is at level 100 and without Degenerator, it's basically impossible to kill them. And the challenge is looking pretty grim, so I decide to just let it go and figure out a solution the next day. And figure it out, I do. Because I'm not going to be using Doom Train in battle anyway, I decide that solely for the sake of getting Selfie a train, I'm allowed to use card mod. I don't get Degenerator as that would be an in-battle spell, and again, I technically be using card mod to grind, which is against the spirit of the challenge, but I do allow myself to get the Malboro tentacles I need from card modding. But there's one more problem. To get a Malboro tentacle, I need four Malboro cards, and I need six of them, which means I need 24 Malboro cards, and you know what that means. So the next day, I have a little casual stream with my Discord. And by the way, if you like these videos and haven't joined my Discord server, click the link in the discriddly do. It's the best place to get updates about new videos and to just hang out and interact with me and my community. We have occasional voice chats, share fun little Final Fantasy puns, and there's even a special section for channel members where we talk a little more privately about the behind the scenes aspects of creating a YouTube channel. I hope I see you there. Anyway, the grind to get Malboro Tantacles is actually really fun because Triple Triad is the most amazing minigame in existence, but it does take about four hours to get all of the tentacles. I mean tentacles. I mean tentacles. But finally, finally, we have six and I click the button and Selfie gets her train. Yes, and we've named Doom Train Sabin after the man who suplexed a train in my recent Final Fantasy VI challenge. Link in the discreetly do. Discreetly do. Discre and now we're in the home stretch and it's time to activate time compression, but not before we have a few more boss fights. The first is with Fujin and Raijin. This battle is similar to the last one, except this time we have Angel Wing to make it a hell of a lot easier. Raijin this time will actually strike hot girls, but that doesn't really matter. We get a Holy, a Flare, and a Meteor, which is enough to take down Raijin, and then Roxanne casts another Holy, bringing Fujin down. That battle took a little under a minute. Next up is Mobile Type 8. I take a moment to drop a bunch of flares, and in that brief window, it uses Corona to take all of my characters down to 1 HP. I'm quick to heal, but Quist just goes down relatively soon after that. Subsequently, it's a struggle to keep them both alive, but eventually Roxanne gets off her angel wing and you know exactly how it goes after that. Just spell after spell after spell until- oh, come on, don't use pain, why do you do that? Anyway, she uses spell after spell after spell until mobile type 8 goes down. It drops two laser cannons, and I use one of those to teach Quist his homing laser, which will come in very handy in just a bit. And the next boss fight is with Cypher. I have one goal during this battle. Well, okay, two goals. The first goal is not to die, but the second goal is to draw a hundred auras from Cypher. This is the only battle in the game where you can draw aura, so I'm taking full advantage. The aura spell makes it easy to get limit breaks at high HP, and that's going to be key to taking full advantage of Roxanne. And once I've done that, we angel wing and prove once and for all that men will never win. But now, we lose our main lady and head on to a rather troublesome boss, Adele. This girl boss has absorbed Roxanne, and we have to both keep her alive and destroy this giant woman. Fortunately, I can draw the regen spell from Roxanne, and I cast it on her to keep her alive. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, the first time I go through this battle, it wears off and Adele drains Roxanne's HP until she dies. And that's a fail boat, which is the worst kind of boat. The second time though, I play a bit more carefully and cast Shell and Regen on Roxanne, having the damage Adele can do to her, and I try to maintain her status effects throughout the battle. And ultimately, the final blow goes to Quistus, who takes out Adele with a homing laser. And by the way, I said blow. And then time compression begins. We use our girl bosses to fight a bunch of other girl bosses, and we also fight a giant worm girl boss. I don't know if I'd call her hot, but I guarantee someone watching this video would. The strategy is the same, but this boss's strong physical attacks result in a few casualties. However, Roxanne ultimately takes it out with a well-timed holy, and we arrive at Ultimecia's castle to find that men have failed, and the only solution to time compression is women. Ultimecia's castle, though, has locked away my women's wiles, and so we have to fight some bosses to get them back. We start with Sphinxara, and all we can do is attack. However, it's weak enough that attacks are enough to 
take it down within a couple minutes, and I unlock Limit Breaks. I take a crack at Try Point next, but I realize that I'm not well equipped enough to make it work, and I flee. So my next victim is Tiamat. I equip Quistis with Fire Draining, making her invincible, but then I unfortunately forget to do the same for Roxanne. So she gets off a few strong spells, but then Roxanne gets taken out by Dark Flare, and I'm stuck with only Quistis attacking, which frankly stinks. She is invincible though, so at least it's an auto win with me holding down the attack button. This battle should have taken about a minute, but due to my incompetence, took about 10. Huge time loss, but he eventually goes down and we unlock magic. Our next victim is Trauma, who is taken down pretty uneventfully by Angel Wing. Meteor and Holy are a godsend. And then we unlock Resurrection to bring the girlies to life. The next is Gargantua, and while he's pretty annoying, his HP is pretty low, so two Angel Wing Holies are enough to destroy him, and we unlock item. Next up is the Jolly Red Giant, who is wearing some of the most revealing underwear I've seen in any Final Fantasy game. And this battle was annoying. This boss has a ton of defense and spirit, and the normal way to defeat him is to cast Meltdown or use Doom Train to lower his defense before you smite him. Unfortunately, I don't have Meltdown and I can't use Doom Train because I used non-women to get it. So we pound away with Angel Wing spells, which honestly do paltry damage, but joyously Roxanne casts Pain, which inflicts the blind status, making our characters able to survive a lot longer. I also use Quistis's Micro Missiles, which deal gravity damage, and they hit for a devastating 10,000 minus one damage, and then again for about 8,000. You go, girlfriend. And then I realized that I actually had a way to inflict the Meltdown status all along. Quistis's Blue Magic Acid. And once I cast that, I banish Golden Bikini Man to the Rocky Horror Realm, and we unlock the draw ability. Next up is Krista, whom I also hit with the Acid Blue Magic ability, and then Roxanne pounds with a Meteor, taking it down in one hit. I also draw Carbuncle from it, even though I won't be using it, and I name it Eevee. And I unlock the save ability. Two more bosses to go before Ultimecia. Tripoint is next, and with Thunderspell's junction to Elemental Defense, it goes much better this time. We're basically invincible. And we unlock the GF ability, and all that's left is Katobopas. But before that, we happen to encounter a Ruby Dragon in the hallway, which is the perfect opportunity to draw up to 100 Meteors on Roxanne. And those will come in very handy, because at this point, I make the decision to optimize Roxanne's Angel Wing. As I mentioned before, Angel Wing randomly casts magic from Roxanne's stock, but it can cast literally any offensive magic. Strong, weak status, it doesn't matter. If she has it and it's meant to be used on an enemy, she can cast it. So I need to get all status spells out of Roxanne's inventory. But another important mechanic of this game is that most spells have a damage cap of 9999, even Ultima. So to optimize Roxanne, we also need to remove all but one offensive spell from her inventory, Meteor. Meteor does multiple weak hits, but with Roxanne's five times multiplier on her spells, even a poorly invested Roxanne can easily break the damage cap. So Meteor gets junction to her magic stat and defensive spells are used for everything else. And we head on to Katobalpas. And here you will see the true power of Roxanne. The only spell she will now cast is Meteor. And Quistis now has some meltdown spells. I literally don't remember where I got them from, but I did get them. I cast one on Katobalpas and one Meteor spell destroys him. Roxanne is a nasty woman and I support that. And finally, we unlock command abilities, which we are literally not using. Now, I do waste a little bit of time here finding the final Rosetta Stone. Unfortunately, I can't even use it. My GFs have no more space for abilities, and I forgot to buy more Amnesia Greens from the Estar Pet Shop. C'est la vie. I also try to beat Omega Weapon, but it's a complete fail. We're not gonna try that again. That means that all we have left is Ultimecia. Our in-game time is 1936, and I could have saved a ton of time by getting Degenerator for Quistus, buying more Amnesia Greens, and drawing Meltdown spells so I could reduce enemies' resistance to damage more quickly, but we've made it here, and I will improve in the next one. And by the way, if you've made it this far in the video, please be a girl boss and subscribe to the channel so that we can reach 42069 followers before I grow too old for memes. These videos are really fun to make because you guys enjoy them and I love reading your comments and hearing what you think. I appreciate each and every one of you. So Ultimecia, a bajillion phases and a bajillion ways to die. In the first phase, our goal is to get Roxanne and Quistus as the only party members. And one meteor from an angel winged Roxanne is enough to take out the first phase. And after we melt down phase two, Roxanne's second meteor takes that out. Unfortunately though, on transition to phase 3, Nala uses Shockwave Pulsar, which does massive damage to my entire party. And since I didn't quite set everyone up perfectly, it takes out my unlucky ladies. And I formulate a plan. The goal in phase 1 will be to set everyone up for success. I need Roxanne and Quistus to both have Shell and Haste, and have near max HP, and then I need Roxanne to have Angel Wing activated. I want Quistus also to have double magic available, just in case Roxanne needs to be healed. So on my second try, I I almost get there. Quistis's HP is a little
the low, though. Roxanne casts Meteor, Quistis cures, and unfortunately, she also gets inflicted with pain, blinding, silencing, and poisoning her. She uses a Mega Elixir, but Nala uses Gravia right before Roxanne finishes off Phase 2, and then Quistis is taken out by Shockwave Pulsar. However, Roxanne is so powerful that she just blazes right through Nala's Phase 2 and 3 with no time wasted. But unfortunately, the final Ultimecia phase starts the battle by casting Hell's Judgment, which reduces Roxanne's HP to 1. She gets off two Meteors, and Ultimecia oddly uses another Hell's Judgment, which does nothing since Roxanne is already at 1 HP. Then Roxanne uses another two Meteors, and then Ultimecia uses Hell's Judgment again, which does nothing and blows away her life spells, NBD. Roxanne then uses another Meteor, but this time RNG is not on my side, and Ultimecia uses her namesake spell Ultima to take away the sliver of health Roxanne has had remaining this whole time. Pretty close and pretty funny that she almost managed to do it alone. So third try. The first phase goes a lot better and I managed to get regen and shell cast on both characters. The first phase goes down and Quistus starts phase two with a double protect just in case. One meteor from Roxanne, a meltdown from Quistus, and then two and three meteor take down phase two. This time both Quistus and Roxanne have the health to survive shockwave pulsar, so now it's just a matter of tactics. Roxanne hits three meteors for the next phase very quickly, taking down phase three, and phase four goes down very quickly as well. Just two meteors is enough to take it out. And now we're on to Ultimecia's final phase. She opens with Hell's Judgment, of course, but this time I have Quistus to heal up Roxanne. Roxanne is hasted this time, so she casts three meteors in a row, and Ultimecia casts Hell's Judgment again. Three more meteors from Roxanne, and we suddenly get dialogue. We're in the home stretch. We need to hit five attacks before she kills us. Ultimecia casts Hell's Judgment to start, Roxanne casts a Meteor, and I cure the party. Then Ultimecia casts a very weak Meteor, and Roxanne gets off another. Ultimecia's next flare does next to nothing, and Quistus attacks, and we have to do damage just twice more to win. Roxanne casts another Meteor, and Ultimecia can't act before Roxanne casts one more, and the game is done. Our final in-game time is around 19 hours and 50 minutes, and if you want to see more Final Fantasy challenges, click this playlist button right here. I promise you will not regret it. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.